All right, thank you, Brendan Kennedy. Um, that was an amazing way to really kick off the day. I'd, no I'd now like to introduce uh, Dr. Jeff Chen. Uh, Dr. Jeff Chen is the director of the UCLA Cannabis Research Initiative, where he leads a team of over 20 faculty members conducting education and groundbreaking research in a cannabis's broader effects, including health, legal, economic, and social impact. He operates at the intersection of cannabis policy, science, and business, and has worked tirelessly to accelerate cannabis research. He is a graduate of the MD MBA program at UCLA and graduated magna cum laude from Cornell University where he studied biology, business, as well as music. Jeff has been an incredible resource for us as we began the journey of creating this conference a year ago, and we are very excited to have him speak about the science of cannabis. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Jeff Chen. Thank you, Connie, for that introduction. It's an honor and pleasure to be here. Um, and, and, you know, Brendan talked a little bit about how his journey uh, down this pathway. And so for me, I was a medical student at UCLA, and we, in your third year medical student, you enter the hospital wards. And being in California, I had a lot of patients either talk about their cannabis use or ask if it was appropriate for them. And it was a question I could never answer. It was a question that my attending uh, physicians and professors couldn't answer, right? So, and this is despite having legal medical cannabis in California for 19 years at that time. We couldn't actually give anybody answers. So I thought, okay, this is fundamentally fascinating. What could I do to advance the ball? And right around this time, I was actually getting my MBA at UCLA. So rather than thinking, you know, how, how could I just push one project forward? How could I hop on one project? Started thinking, how do I build an organization? How do I uh, create something that scales uh, more than I do? So today we're going to be talking about uh, cannabis science. So this, I'm going to call this this uh, cannabis science 101 course. Um, you guys are my uh, uh, students today, and let's get started. So, Cannabis Science 101, aka the best class ever uh, in your life, um, aka this is all we do in this course room. So, this is a little different. You guys are seated today wearing real clothes. Um, but on a more serious subject, uh, we're today going to be diving, I'm going to give you a good overview uh, of the science of cannabis. And this is actually the cover of Time Magazine two years ago. And uh, yes, in, in case you were wondering, uh, I do spend a lot of my time trying to figure out how to teach mice to use little lighters. It's very difficult, right? Like, you don't have a thumb. How do you, how do you flick the thing? I don't, it doesn't. Also, where do you find these tiny lighters? They're not on Amazon. Right? Amazon, store, warehouse is store of everything. Doesn't have tiny mouse lighters. Like, come on. All right, so, uh, but in all seriousness, today we're gonna cover a few big topics. So number one, you know, you in this room, you in this room, you in this room, all your bodies make cannabinoids. These molecules uh, are very similar to the, the compounds made by the cannabis plant. We only discovered this recently. We're also going to talk about the fact that cannabis is not harmless. This is, there are significant risks and harms that we should be aware of to have a rational conversation. There is also immense medical potential that Brendan alluded to some of it, um, as well as there are massive barriers to research that are preventing us from uh, realizing this potential. Okay, so our story today starts 600 million years ago, okay? And so you might be thinking, what the heck was going on 600 million years ago? And so if you're anything like my nephew, the first thing that you might blurt out of your mouth is dinosaurs, because he, he loves dinosaurs, right? You ask him, like, what'd you do at school today, dinosaurs? Uh, what'd you learn today, dinosaurs? I'm like, are you learning that every day? Are they teaching you math, science? <laughs> It's weird. But you would be incorrect because, you know, dinosaurs were about 100 to 200 million years ago. We're talking much, much, much older than the dinosaurs. So 600 million years ago is when we believe endocannabinoids first developed in multicellular life. Okay, and so these are signals. These are messenger molecules. So to give you an analogy, uh, if you have, a, so let's say you have a, a, a ignition keyhole to an engine. Okay, that's something we call a receptor in, the, in, the, in, in uh, living organisms. And you have messenger molecules, such as endocannabinoids, that are the key to that receptor. And so if, if you have the right signal, the right key, it'll fit in that keyhole and be able to turn on the engine. And once the engine is on, all of these things will happen in the cell. Okay, and that's actually a very good analogy. You re it's, it's truly a key and keyhole analogy, like physically on a molecular level, that's how they're interacting to unlock and, and transmit the signal into all of these cellular processes. And so endocannabinoids, endo meaning internal, cannabinoid meaning cannabis-like. And we only discovered this system about 25 years ago. And when we, when we discovered this system, at first we didn't call it anything, right? It's like here's some, some interesting molecules 
uh, these interesting messengers and receptors that we found. And then we realized that things like THC were also impacting the same receptors. So THC and endocannabinoids uh, are, are acting on the same receptors. So in a way, THC is actually mimicking the endocannabinoids that our bodies naturally make. And the system, you might first just think that, okay, you know, the effects of cannabis, maybe it's just limited to your brain. Well, it's very concentrated. So this is the density of receptors, of endocannabinoid receptors, right? The keyholes all over your body. Are, they are concentrated in your brain, but you can also find that they're all throughout your body. They're in your fat. They're in your bone. They're in your uh, uh, muscle tissue. They're on your white blood cells. They're on your skin cells. They're in your organs. They're everywhere throughout your body. And then if you look at the functions of the endocannabinoid system, it's also diverse. Um, and so some of these functions, you might be, it might make a lot of sense if you're familiar with the effects of cannabis. You might look at things like the effects of the endocannabinoid system on appetite or, or pain, for example. But there's other ones that you might not expect as much, that the endocannabinoid system is implicated in uh, metabolism and immune function. That kind of explains some of the effects that we see of cannabinoids on some of these mouse studies, and I'll talk more about that later. All right, so 600 million years ago, evolution of the endocannabinoid system. 100 million years ago, dinosaurs went extinct. And, uh, and today, we still find that the endocannabinoid system is actually present in all of these animals. Basically, anything that has a vertebra makes endocannabinoids. Everything from frogs to mice to fish to us, we all make endocannabinoids because this is such an old, evolutionarily preserved system. And about 40 million years ago, that's when the, we believe the cannabis plant evolved. And this plant happened to make things called cannabinoids. It made things like THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, and things like CBD, cannabidiol. So before today's lecture, who here in the room has actually heard of CBD? Show of hands. Wow, that's almost everybody. Three years ago, if I had asked that question, zero to one hands might have gone up in this room. That's how quickly CBD has hit mainstream attention, driven initially by the, the parents of epileptic, epileptic children who were reporting the use of it. But those are just two cannabinoids. There are over 100 different cannabinoids in cannabis, vast majority of which have never been researched. They've never been put into an animal or a human to see what happens there. And we'll talk more about this later. So, uh, you know, 40 million years ago, cannabis evolves. It's making these cannabinoids, and these cannabinoids, again, are mimicking the endocannabinoids that we make, right? They are both THC and our endocannabinoids are similar-looking keys that open the same keyhole that start all of these downstream cellular processes, okay? Um, and you might be surprised to, to know that if there's a way that we could actually impact endocannabinoid system activity, we could potentially be impacting nearly or, or many, if not, if not almost all, diseases that affect humans. So this is actually a review paper out of the US NIH, which is the federal government's biomedical research arm, uh, where they went through all of the literature that we know about how the endocannabinoid system is implicated in both health as well as disease. And we're finding that if there's some way that we could impact the endocannabinoid system, we could have therapeutic potential in almost all diseases affecting humans. And cannabinoids are a modulator of endocannabinoid system activity. They're not the only modulator, diet, Exercise, other drugs also modulate the endocannabinoid system activity. But cannabinoids are one very important modulator that we should be aware of. Okay, so 40 million years ago, cannabis evolves. Now we jump to about 3,000 years ago when we have the first recorded written uses uh, uh, concerning cannabis consumption uh, for, for medical use or for, for spiritual recreational use. Um, we were using cannabis maybe about 10,000 years ago, but mainly it's for fiber and industrial hemp purposes. It was really 3,000 years ago in China that we had the first uh, recorded medical uses. And so this is this um, mythical emperor, Shang Neng, who has been uh, uh, accredited with, with authoring uh, these materials. And this is the Chinese character for Ma, which means both cannabis as well as anesthesia in China. And that character has been preserved for a really long time. And so, you know, you might be wondering, so um, Emperor Shang Neng, when some of his uh, 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 officials asked him, you know, Emperor, how is it that you discovered these properties? He went, well, you, you know, I, I, I smoked it, but I didn't inhale. So just, <laughs> you can, okay? 
I'm glad you like that. All right, so 3,000 years ago, it's discovered in China, and we see we can actually document uh, in written text the spread of the medical use of cannabis to the Middle East, where it's adopted by uh, uh, the Persians and, and the Indian Hindus. Uh, it's adopted by the Romans and the Greeks. It makes its way to medieval Europe, um, and then eventually gets its way over to the U.S., where about 150 years ago, it's officially entered into the U.S. pharmacopoeia. And this is the official uh, uh, book, this, the, the standard setting document that describes all uh, uh, recognized medicines. And in the pharmacopoeia in 1850, uh, cannabis is, is listed as having all of these use cases, some of which were probably a little hokey and, and misinformed, but there's a few that I want to draw your attention to. And it's because if you look at the national conversation today, the, the, the surge in recent interest as well as the emerging science, these are some areas that only today we're finally diving into the science of and having a conversation about. But we were already widely using and recognizing uh, the use for these uh, indications 150 years ago. And you also might be surprised to know that even as late as 100 years ago, physicians in America would prescribe cannabis. You would go to the pharmacy, you'd pick up a cannabis tincture bottle, similar to you know, the tinctures being made by, for instance, Tilray in Canada. Um, and some of today's existing largest pharmaceutical companies manufactured cannabis tinctures 100 years ago. You go to a pharmacy and you pick it up. This was completely normal. Um, and in fact, the American Medical Association actually uh, went to Congress and tried to prevent the uh, restrictions on cannabis that happened in the 1930s, saying that this is medicine that we use. Why are we doing this? Okay, so now let's talk a bit. We talked about the history. Now let's actually dive into what's actually in the plant. What's under the hood? <clears throat> so, like I said, cannabis makes cannabinoids, right? And there are over 100 different cannabinoids. Uh, the two most abundant ones are THC and, and CBD. In a really simple way, you can create a dichotomy. One's psychoactive, one's not. But I'll, I'll try to differentiate the properties more. But again, there's over 100 different cannabinoids. These two just tend to be the most abundant in, in, in most varieties of cannabis that we see today. But just because you have a specific cannabinoid that is present in very small quantities doesn't mean that it doesn't have a physiologic impact. So if you look at, in pharmacology, if you look at the dosing spectrum of drugs, it can go from milligrams of a drug to have a physiologic effect all the way to grams. So that's a thousand fold on this scale. So just because something is in low concentration, you know, it might be one one hundredth the concentration of THC in, in a particular cannabis plant, doesn't mean that it doesn't have physiologic effect. But again, we, we, most of these have never been studied. So let's talk about THC. <clears throat> so uh, it's responsible for this shift in perception that you have when you're intoxicated. Uh, it can change your, your perception of sound, taste, smell, all these things. Uh, it does stimulate appetite. Yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, you know, she knows. Uh, it also releases dopamine, which can cause the, the, you know, the euphoria uh, related with cannabis. And, and we believe that you know, this is playing a role in the kind of uh, abuse dependence aspect uh, that can result from cannabis use. Uh, short term, it can also impair memory. So while you're acutely stoned, you will have deficits uh, in certain forms of memory during that period of time. And uh, impairment in motor coordination. So what does that mean? It means you have about a doubling of your risk of car accidents. Um, but you compare that with alcohol, when you're over the legal limit of alcohol, it's significantly higher, 6 to 8x. And if you start looking at texting while driving it, it jumps even higher than that, right? Um, so contrast that with CBD. Very, very different uh, things we're talking about. So first off, it's non-psychoactive. It doesn't have any effects, as we can tell, on motor coordination. Uh, no euphoria, and that's why we don't think that there's much of a dependency or addictive potential to CBD. Uh, does not stimulate appetite. And in fact, in some of these animal studies, it looked like it might even uh, slightly curb appetite in some of these animal studies. And also, if you combine it with THC, there's, there's some evidence to suggest that it might actually block the psychoactivity of THC. So very different molecules. And the other inter interesting thing about CBD is, so THC definitely does have therapeutic potential. CBD might have a, a wider uh, range of therapeutic potential is evidenced by uh, this quote. So this is from Dr. Volkow about two years ago. She was testifying in Congress. She's the director of the U.S. National Institute on Drug Abuse. So she is the federal research arm for studying the abuse potential of drugs. And in testifying in front of Congress, 
uh, she basically talks about how there's preliminary evidence, animal studies, talk, showing that CBD has anti-seizure properties, that it's an antioxidant, like resveratrol from wine. It has neuroprotective properties, its ability to uh, 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 prevent death in neurons, anti-inflammatory properties, analgesic properties, so anti-pain, anti-tumor, actually killing cancer cells, slowing their growth or preventing their spread, antipsychotic properties um, that have recently been demonstrated in the first human trials in the last few years in schizophrenics uh, and working as we see it as well as our, uh, some of our co conventionally used antipsychotic drugs and anti-anxiety properties. So this is pretty fascinating, but again, all very preliminary. Most of this information is stuck at the animal stage. Very few, very little of it has progressed uh, uh, in, in humans. Um, okay, so we talked about cannabinoids being present in cannabis, but there's also things called terpenes. So who here in this room before Brendan's talk has heard of terpenes before? What? Again, a few years ago had I asked, you know, it would have been significantly less. So terpenes, anytime you smell a plant and you smell something, you're smelling a terpene. And these are not unique to cannabis, but they are particularly diverse in cannabis. Um, over, I think, you know, over 100, um, and maybe as much as over 200, different terpenes have been identified to be expressed by different strains of cannabis. So this is one example of a terpene. It's present in lavender, linalool. It's also present in cannabis. Um, and it has anti-anxiety and, and some anti-pain properties in, in preliminary studies. So we're talking about cannabinoids. We're talking about terpenes. There's hundreds of compounds floating around. And that naturally leads to a discussion of the, the entourage effect. And it's this hypothesis that the, the combination and the synergistic activity of all of these different compounds is superior to that of any individual cannabinoid than just THC by itself or just CBD by itself. And again, there's some preliminary evidence to suggest this. So for instance, when you administer a whole plant cannabis extract and administer an identical amount of just CBD, for example, you see different physiologic responses uh, in, in the animals that are tested. But it's still a hypothesis, right? But this is something that if you talk to people in the cannabis industry, that you'll, this will come up again and again and again. And that leads me to this point. So there actually are approved cannabinoids uh, throughout the world. So for instance, Marinol, here on the left, that is synthetic THC. It's THC created in a lab, put in a pill. That's been FDA approved for 30 years, more than 30 years. And whereas cannabis is a Schedule One drug, Cocaine and, cocaine and uh, meth are Schedule II. THC is a Schedule IV drug when administered as Marinol. Um, and then you have uh, preparations of Sativex, which is approved throughout the EU. And this is it's literally cannabis extract. They grow cannabis in the UK, and they extract out the cannabinoids and make this medicine. And it's approved throughout the EU. And Epidiolex is undergoing FDA approval right now in the US. All right. Now, the other thing that you might hear is all these miraculous stories about cannabis. Right? It cured my mom's ex. My neighbor's dog had a wart, and it, I put cannabis oil on it, and it went away. Right? And, you might, you might start, and, and there's some people that you talk to that think this is some miracle, miraculous panacea uh, drug. And, and I caution all of you to take all of that with a grain of salt. Right? And so whenever someone comes up to you and opens with, hey, I heard, I, I read a story that cannabis does blank, I want you to be, I want you to be super skeptical, like this skeptical chihuahua, all right? So as soon as they start talking, I want, I want you to squint your left eye and, and bug out your right eye, right? And so we have, to, we have to take all this with a grain of salt, and a lot of it we probably have to toss out, but not all of it, right? There's definitely some kernels of truth there. In fact, before we had rigorous placebo-blinded controlled trials, which have only been around for less than 100 years, everything that humans knew about anything was from pattern recognition. As creatures, we are very good at pattern recognition as a species. That's why we've been able to advance so far. So again, eventually you see something long enough, there's a pattern that arises. Um, and, and, it's, uh, and, and sometimes it's, it's worth it to kind of chase after uh, some of these um, uh, patterns or anecdotes that we see. All right, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the harms as well. And there are significant ones we should be aware of. Um, so let's start with uh, some deaths of Americans each year caused by some other common uh, drugs or, or, or substances in society. So tobacco is still, you know, we talk about the epi opioid epidemic, but tobacco is still killing about half a million Americans a year. And NSAIDs, things like aspirin, ibuprofen, Aleve, Advil, Motrin, kills about 10,000 
Americans a year. Um, and so then you compare that number for cannabis, and it's you know, near zero. And the reason I put the question mark is there's probably some you know, traffic accidents where someone was stoned and they killed themselves. But if you talk about direct toxicity, direct overdose of cannabis, it's pretty much close to zero. We don't have really any documented cases ever compared to 10,000 a year dying from non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin, ibuprofen. Okay. But I don't mean to, I don't mean to you know, gloss the harms over because there's a very significant risk that nobody's talking about, the media isn't talking about. I want you to look at this number. 440,000. These are the amounts of lives of Cheetos every minute <laughs> that die as a result of cannabis. It's a travesty. It's an epidemic. And nobody's doing anything to prevent Cheetos from the harms of cannabis. But, but on all seriousness, there are some significant harms we need to be aware of. So for instance, it appears that in individuals that are genetically predisposed to schizophrenia, using cannabis early on in life will increase the odds that they actually do develop schizophrenia. <clears throat> uh, women who are pregnant and use cannabis during pregnancy give birth to babies with lower birth weight. Uh, adolescents that uh, begin heavy cannabis use uh, during their adolescence uh, we see there's an association with uh, lower socioeconomic achievement later in life, lower educational attainment. Uh, then there's the issue of dependency and abuse. So some people will say cannabis is not addictive, and that's just frankly not true. Um, a, a widely cited uh, a study shows that about 10% of people who try cannabis once will at some point in their life go on to be dependent on it. Okay, that's 10%. That's not zero. It's 10%. But you do have to compare that with alcohol, which is about 15%, and nicotine, 32%, one of the most addictive substances known to man. Okay, so it's not, there is addictive potential. Statistically, it might be lower than that of other substances, but it's non-zero. Also, cannabis withdrawal, it's a real thing, 100%. You do have, you can have physical symptoms of withdrawal. Not everybody gets it, not everyone experiences it, we're not exactly sure why, but it is a real thing. And for some people, when they're trying to quit cannabis use, and they stop, and they feel they get restless, they have no appetite, they have no energy, they can't sleep at night, that can perpetuate the dependency cycle, and they go back on it. And then if you're whispering to your friend, no, you can't have withdrawal from cannabis, what are you talking about? Then you're just making it even harder for them to get help that they need. Um, what about the effects of cannabis on cognition or memory? So in adults, in, in, in chronic cannabis users, in adults, we do, there's some studies that show a mild decrease in certain forms of memory. But this appears to be temporary because when you uh, are go abstinent, within about 30 days, those mild deficits in memory correct. Okay? And the last issue, uh, uh, lung cancer. Right? We find no association between cannabis use and lung cancer. Even heavy, heavy daily use for decades, no association with risk of lung cancer. All right, so let's wrap this up talking a little bit about what I see coming down the pipeline in terms of the therapeutic potential as well as the globalization. So uh, Brendan talked a lot about this, but yeah, the spread of medical cannabis around the world, right? So now the U.S. is the only country in North America sandwiched between, sandwiched between Canada and Mexico that does not have nationally legal medical cannabis. But, and this trend is going to continue as, as country, more and more countries legalize medical cannabis. Um, in terms of some of the most interesting use cases for cannabis, I'm just going to focus on three today for, for the sake of time. So this whole issue of it being a potential opioid substitute, right? So uh, first off, we know that cannabinoids are effective for chronic pain. Okay? Number two, there are preliminary studies that show that uh, these opioid-sparing properties of cannabinoids. So when you combine cannabinoids with opioids, you can reduce the opioid dose up to 10 times and still achieve the same amount of pain relief, right? So you're take, you, have, you need this much opioids to achieve pain relief. You can drop it as much as 10x and add a little bit of cannabinoids and achieve that same amount of pain relief. Uh, we see epidemiologically there's an association between states that legalize medical cannabis and lower opioid overdoses. 
And the last part is we know uh, cannabinoids can reduce neuroinflammation, and we believe that neuroinflammation is also implicated as a component in both chronic pain as well as opioid dependence. So the ability of cannabinoids to, to treat the pain itself, to work synergistically with the opioids, as well as to reduce the neuroinflammation that might be exacerbating the pain or the opioid dependency. Uh, then there's the anti-tumor properties of cannabis that were alluded to in that uh, Dr. Nora Volkow's quote. So we do see in animal studies uh, across many, many different types of cancers, there, there's tons of different cancer types, some have been tested with cannabinoids. So both THC and CBD, um, as well as some other cannabinoids, can actually cause these cancer cells to self-destruct. They can also prevent the growth of blood vessels that go and feed the tumor, as well as preventing the tumor from spreading. Again, very preliminary, um, but they just did the first human study of this uh, for uh, brain cancer, uh, glioblastoma multiform, the first uh, exploratory trial of this in humans. So we are starting to embark into human studies. The best part is it's non-toxic to normal cells. So chemotherapy, many chemotherapy agents, are they're a shotgun approach. Yes, they kill the cancer cell, but in the process, they're killing any cells that are rapidly growing, the lining of your stomach, your hair, things of that nature. And the last part is, you know, cancer patients have a lot of symptoms that, that cannabinoids might have therapeutic potential for. And so now you talk about one compound that could be treating you know, a, a whole wide array of symptoms and potentially for certain cancers might be slowing the growth and treating that aspect. So now you're talking about rather than having to take six drugs, each of which has their own side effects, then you talk about the cost of it, then you talk about drug-drug interactions. So each drug has its own side effects, then you have drug-drug interactions which cause another level order of side effects. Um, cannabinoids are also neuroprotectants. So this is actually a patent um, entitled Cannabinoids as Antioxidants and Neuroprotectants. And this patent is actually owned by the U.S. federal government. And it's old. It's from 2003. And it's from research that was done at the NIH on cannabinoids. And if you read the body of the patent, it talks about how cannabinoids have been found to be useful in age-related diseases, inflammatory diseases, autoimmune diseases like lupus, Crohn's, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, right? And as our baby boomers are, 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 are we're massively expanding the amount of senior citizens in this country, we're, the next epidemic that's going to come is an epidemic of neurodegeneration, right? Age is one of the biggest risk factors for things like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Okay, so that brings me to this last point. So if I were to ask you, what is the most popular herb in America, right? And I wasn't giving you a talk on cannabis, you might think, oh, it's, you know, ginkgo, echinacea, turmeric, right? And the market size of those herbs is on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars a year in sales. Whereas we're talking about the market size of cannabis in America, it's tens of billions, right? So a hundred times larger than the second most popular herb in America. So cannabis is America's most popular herb. And that leads me to some other, you know, observations um, that, that people have had about cannabis as a therapeutic agent, right? So the idea that it could be cost-effective and, and democratized, right? You can't patent it. You can't monopolize it. It's a plant. Um, and there's a reason it's called weed, right? It grows very robustly. You don't, it doesn't need a lot of care. It's not like an orchid where you got to, like, you know, like, uh, uh, you know. It just grows by the side of the road in, in, in many parts of the world. Um, the idea that it might be safe, right? We saw that statistically less people die from cannabis, much less people die from cannabis than even die from over-the-counter drugs like Tylenol, ibuprofen. And the last part is the, the potential. We talked about a lot of potential use cases, right? But now, again, you're talking about one agent that could be used for different symptoms or different conditions, right? So that's, that's, I find that very interesting. And that sounds great. There's only one catch, though. And that's it's so incredibly difficult to do research on this. And that's because for the last 50 years, cannabis has been a Schedule I drug. Even to this day, it's a Schedule I drug. Highest potential for abuse, no medical use. So researchers have to go through inordinate barriers to be able to get approval to touch cannabis and give it to a mice or give it to a human. Not only that, we're blocked from federal funding. So if you want to do therapeutic research on cannabis, you're not going to get federal funding. So the federal government funds on the order of about $200 million a year of harm research into cannabis, pretty much close to zero for therapeutic research. Now, amplify that over the last 50 years. 
200 million a year. And so the only way that we can do this research is, I think philanthropy is gonna be a large component of it. And, you know, and we are seeing philanthropists come onto the scene. So in Australia, there was a billionaire uh, banker whose daughter was dying of seizures. He gave her CBD, it seemed to work, and he donated uh, $30 million towards research. Largest gift ever for cannabis research. It was only about a year and a half ago, two years ago. So it's starting to come online. The philanthropists are starting to show up because we can't get really funding from anywhere else. These clinical trials are expensive, millions and millions and millions of dollars per clinical trial. Um, and lastly, I'll just end by talking a bit about what we're building here at, uh, or not here, building at UCLA. Um, so uh, we're about five months in uh, to the Cannabis Research Initiative, UCLA, one of the first programs in the world, uh, first academic programs in the world focused on the study of cannabis. Um, and our mission really is to broadly study the impacts on health, so both the positive aspects as well as the negative aspects. Right? We can't gloss over the potential harms, especially as we are creating entirely new cannabis product categories that we don't know what they do. What, what does a 95% THC concentrate dabbed, uh, what, is, what does that do to you? I, we don't know. Um, well, our top priority that, that our research teams are working on right now is we want to conduct the world's first human study where we administer cannabis to chronic pain patients who are on opioids to see if it could potentially reduce or eliminate their opioid use. Again, you see so much conversation about this issue but no one's done the clinical trials to, to directly see what it can do to, to opioid use. Um, but we're still very early on in the study. It's going to take tons and tons of uh, money and resources to actually pull this off. But it's, 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 our, it's, our, it's one of our uh, uh, dreams right now is to pull off this study. Um, you take a look at our website, some educational materials there. You can take a look at some of the existing studies we have going on. We have about 30 faculty members that I've recruited uh, into the initiative. And with that, that's the end of my talk. So thank you, everybody.